Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. It's so good to be here this morning and to be together online as well. My name is Jen Crow. I'm one of the ministers here at First Universalist, and it's a joy to be gathering in all the ways that we can today, whether that's in person or over Zoom or catching up through the podcast or on YouTube throughout the week. It is so good and important to connect in community. And you are totally welcome to run about any time that you need to, to move your body. Everybody is welcome and wanted and worthy here. So welcome in particular to First Universalist Church, where we have been gathering for over 160 years to proclaim the good news that you are beloved, that you are important, that you are welcome exactly as you are that this is an ever-expanding circle of love and care and connection. And not only do we speak these words, but then we work through our actions in the world to create the beloved community that we long for. That is what we are about. Hey, you're gonna come lead with me? Do you want to? You okay with it? Do you wanna, is it okay if I play? All right, can I pick you up? All right, what's your name? What's that? Cormick. Cormick. Do you want to read some stuff with me? Hi, Cormick. Okay, so this is the life we invite you into here at this church. This is a community of welcoming, where we welcome, protect, and affirm the light in each and every human heart, where we listen deeply to where love is calling us next, and where we act with compassion and humility and courage in the service to justice. We do all of this as a community that's committed to ending oppression in all of its forms. That is who we are. And whether we're gathering in person or online, we remember and we celebrate that we live in bodies, right? So we encourage you to tend to your body as we worship together and as throughout our time together. So right, like if you need to run around, no biggie. If you need to stretch, if you need to talk a little bit to somebody, it's all okay. You ready to go? <laughs> so we care for ourselves for each other in so many different ways and we know like i said that we are in bodies so we take care of one another in this time ongoing time of covid 19 as well where if you join with us in person we encourage everybody that can be to be vaccinated to wear a mask while you're in the building unless you're speaking from the pulpit to ask permission before you go in for a hug and just reminder to each other as well that we will sing in the sanctuary together a bit and if that with our masks on if that doesn't feel comfortable or you want a different space we are also live streaming the service downstairs in the cummins room so that's always an opportunity if you want a little more room um, to be able to have that so we take care of each other in so many ways and that is who we are and what we're about so if you're new to us this morning, I'll say it a little bit, this is a special service, so you might notice we're a little lighter in attendance today, but uh, I'll talk about that in just a second, but I want you to know you're welcome here. We're so glad that you're here. There are lots of ways to get connected. So some of that is by signing up for our newsletter, join us for coffee hour. If you're here in person down in the social hall after the service, take a moment to see the gorgeous photos that are down there by Wing Young Huey in his exhibit, Chineseness, the meanings of identity and the nature of belonging. And then come on back next weekend. So on June 4th in the parking lot from nine to noon, we'll be hosting Electric Saturday. So perhaps you have thought, there, what are the ways that you can respond to the climate crisis that we are in? What are the ways you can make changes in your own life that might support uh, a healthier planet? Come join us, like I said, next Saturday from 9 to noon. There'll be people here who, from the congregation, kind of sharing and showing their experience with all kinds of electric opportunities, from e-bikes to mowers and snowblowers and cars and scooters. Come talk to folks and learn more. And also our environmental justice team will be here, and several climate organizations will be here too, with tables and information. So next Saturday, June 4th, 9 to noon, right in our parking lot. 
And then on Sunday, join us again here, 10 a.m., in person or online for our worship service. It'll be our annual flower communion service, which is a wonderful opportunity for us to experience and remember the ways that we create something so much more together in this constant exchange of giving and receiving and growing. So we'll invite you, if you're coming in person, to bring a flower with you. We'll also have plenty here to share, and together we will create beauty and we will leave with beauty. If you were here with us for our Easter Sunday, you know that uh, every now and then we have an amazing band with us. Dean McGraw and Amy K. Bryant and Franco will be here as part of that band next weekend on Sunday morning, so don't miss that. And then stick around after the service. We'll have food under the tent and then come back up into the sanctuary if you're here in person or join online at noon for our annual meeting of the congregation. At this meeting, we're going to do some important work of transformation and joy together. Not only will we do the businessy work of approving the budget for the next year and electing our leaders from within the congregation, but we're also gonna be voting to adopt the eighth principle, which is a way of institutionalizing our commitment to racial justice in our core faith statements. So please be a part of that. And then also the congregation will be voting to call the Reverend Arif Mamdani as our associate minister, which is awesome. And you want to be a part of that historic vote. And we need a quarter of our membership to be able to do that. That's 250 people engaged in the meeting. So please, if you're a member, be engaged in that meeting, be there for it, and please make it a point, if you're a member as well, to invite five or 10 other people to please be there for this historic vote. We need to have everybody present for this. So this morning's worship is a gift from our larger Unitarian Universalist Association to our congregations. So congregations all around the world are receiving this gift of connection. And it will be a largely recorded service with some pieces that I will do, but mostly we'll be receiving from the UUA today. And as we prepare ourselves for that, I want to invite us into our particular practices here. So every time we gather in the sanctuary, we have been, and online, we have been engaging in this practice of three intentional breaths together, a way to settle ourselves and our bodies that we might be in a space to receive and to really be grounded. So I invite you to do this any way that you like or not do it at all if you hate it, but I am putting my feet on the floor, taking a moment to notice the places where my body touches the floor or the pulpit. Maybe for you, you're noticing what your body is touching. Maybe you're taking a moment to let your shoulders drop down Move your head around if that feels right. Maybe soften your gaze. And then I invite us to breathe on purpose together. Breathing in. Breathing out. Super, super slow. Breathing in. Breathing out slowly. And again, at your own pace, breathing in. Breathing out. From this place of connection with our body, our breath, and the places we are. We recognize that here in this sanctuary, this building has held our congregation for 29 years. This sanctuary that was once home for a Jewish congregation, here on land that was and is still home to indigenous peoples, here on this land that holds and tells many stories, layer upon layer upon layer, we remember that we are stewards of a place for a short time, and that in this time, we receive the past with all of its contradictions and promising aspirations, and together we take responsibility for our part, healing what we can, shaping the present and the future in the direction of freedom and liberation for us all. Come, let us worship together.
You are a miracle in motion. I greet you with wonder. In a world which seeks to own your joy and your imagination, you have chosen to be free every day as a practice. I can never know the struggles you went through to get here, but I know you have swum upstream and at times it has been lonely. I want you to know I honor the choices you made in solitude and I honor the work you have done to belong. I honor your commitment to that which is larger than yourself and your journey to love the particular container of life that is you. You are enough. Your work is enough. You are needed. Your work is sacred. You are here. I am grateful. You are enough. You are needed. You are here and I am grateful. If you are experiencing this worship service in community, I invite you to greet one another using one of those phrases or a similar phrase. You might be opening up the chat and chatting it to the whole group or to someone you know. You might be leaving it in the comments. If you are sitting on your couch with someone, you might turn and say this to them. You are enough. You are needed. You are here and I am grateful. Now, if you're not experiencing this worship service in real time in community, you still have a community. So feel free to pick up your phone and text someone these words or DM someone these words. Pick anyone who you want to say these words to. You are enough or you are needed or you are here and I am grateful. And if it's you who needs most to receive these words, say them silently to yourself or imagine all of us saying them to you. You are enough. You are needed. You are here and we are grateful. Please greet one another. When I was younger, I enjoyed using multiple colors of embroidery floss to create friendship bracelets. Remembering the act of pulling each string into the other reminds me of the relationships we build together in our congregations and our wider association. Though our theologies, identities, and lived experiences vary, we choose to come together because we share a common vision. And just as when one of the threads fray a little and I gently pull it back into the pattern, so too do we call each other back into relationship when we inevitably fail to live up to our principles, values, and covenants. Friends, beloveds, may the light of our chalice illuminate the paths we're on and remind us that though our paths are many, we travel side by side for our dreams and goals are woven together.
We're all connected, bird, cloud, and tree. We're all connected, earth, wind, and sea. Woven in a single garment of destiny, we're all connected, breath, you and me. We're all connected, bird, cloud, and tree. We're all connected, bird, cloud, and tree. We're all connected, earth, wind, and sea. We're all connected, earth, wind, and sea. Connected, breath, you and me. We're all connected. We're all connected. Bird, cloud, and tree. Bird, cloud, and tree. We're all connected. We're all connected. Earth, wind, and sea. Earth, wind, and sea. Woven in a single garment of destiny. We're all connected. We're all connected. Breath of you and me. Breath of you and me. We're all connected. We're all connected. Bird, cloud, and tree. Bird, cloud, and tree. We're all connected. We're all connected. Earth, wind, and sea. Earth, wind, and sea. Woven in a single garment of destiny. We're all connected. We're all connected. Breath you and me. Breath you and me. We're all connected. We're all connected. Breath you and me. Hi. So Sage. And Unitarian Universalism, we talk about how we are all connected. And when I say that all people in the world are connected, what do you what do you think about that or what does it bring up for you? Um, I think it brings up uh, like if some, everyone's connected like on the ground, I like how trees is it touching. Like if one she's here and one she's there. Right. So even though we can't tell that the roots of trees are touching, they're still touching and yeah. they're still connected. And so that reminds you of how people are all connected. Yeah. And then what are some ways in which we are all connected? Can you um, give me like an example? Like if we're best friends or um, family. So best friends and families can be connected. Yeah, what about what I do can impact other people, right? So if I'm in a classroom and I sneeze, achoo, but I don't cover my nose or my mouth with my elbow, what can happen to my friends in the classroom? Um, they can get germs. Yeah, they can get my germs. So even though I say, no, I'm okay, I don't need a tissue, I don't need to cover my mouth, what should I do? Um, you should cover your mouth even though you don't want to. Right, because what I do can impact other people because we are all connected. Awesome. Thank you. Mm. Bye. So, Bradshaw, in Unitarian Universalism, we often talk about this interconnected web in which we are all a part of. Can you kind of share with me your thoughts on the interconnectedness of all of us during this time in history? Not only do I think that humanity is a thing that connects us together, I also think it's experiences and what we've been through. 
So I always thought growing up that we were all connected, but I really felt like there was no way to share that or, or, or prove that. Like, I felt like what I did impacted other people. And there were always those people who were like, the only thing that matters is what I do because I am the only person that it bothers. But then when we had COVID, that was a clear example <laughs> that we are all connected because what I do impacts everyone else. So COVID started with one person and now we saw this worldwide pandemic because people weren't washing their hands or wearing masks or social distancing or whatever you want to say they were or were not doing. But it clearly showed that we are connected and what one of us does clearly impacts everyone else. So if I tear down a rainforest in some tropical location, it will impact people on the other side of the world. So what we do does matter, like not just for us, but for those outside of our sphere. So Bradshaw, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's true, but in the instance that you brought up with the trees being cut down, I think not only that connects us humans, but also us creatures of earth, mm. as that will affect the animals and the ecosystem. Oh, that's really good. I was only thinking it of it as in terms of mankind, but I guess the interconnected web in which we are all a part also applies to um, animals and and trees and, and whatnot. Hmm. I really like that. A beautiful quilt hangs on the wall in my home office where I now spend so much of my time, including taping many of my recordings. It was made by Unitarian Universalist Jennifer Centric, then a member of the first UU Church of Youngstown, Ohio, where I served as minister. I hung it up early in the pandemic when I realized that little office would be the place where I would spend most of my days. The quilt brings me joy. The cacophony of rainbow colors signify welcome and inclusion. Each triangle brings its own bright beauty, a celebration of the individuality of each person. And there's a whimsical line of stitching that runs throughout and along the quilt's border, bringing a feeling of playfulness and the joy that is present in belonging. As a whole, the quilt reminds me of how we are all stitched together an expression of our fundamental interdependence. If there's one thing the last two years of pandemic have taught us, it's the reality of our inescapable interconnectedness, experiencing wave after wave of COVID-19 spreading quickly across the globe reminds us that our lives are inextricably woven together. Early in the pandemic, we learned to wear masks, understanding that I wear my mask to protect you and you wear your mask to protect me. We rely on one another and we can act to protect one another or our actions can put each other at more risk. As Unitarian Universalists, we have long articulated the importance of interdependence. We name it in our principles. We know it from our understanding of science and biology, and we understand it as Universalists who reject ideologies of supremacy rooted in notions of the saved and the damned, instead embracing the worth and dignity of every person and the knowledge that no one is outside the circle of love. We know we belong to each other and we belong to the earth and the web of creation itself. So what does this reality of our interdependence mean for our theology? Well, it's reflected in one of the ways we describe Unitarian Universalism. We say we are not a creedal tradition, but a covenantal one. We don't have a creed which all must profess. We don't all believe the same things about the nature of God or gods or even share the same religious background. But what does bind us? The promises we make to one another about how we will live together in community and how we will live together in our larger world. You see, as Unitarian Universalists, a far more important question than what do you believe is how are we to live? And we answer this question through covenant. Covenant is our religious response to our fundamental interdependence. 
because we are interconnected, because we belong to each other, our religious and moral impulse guides us to make promises to nurture the threads of our connection with justice and compassion and equity. Now, early formulations of covenant were understood as among believers with their God. But over the centuries, the influence of Unitarianism, Universalist theology, along with humanism, have reoriented our notions of covenant to be rooted in our relationships with one another, our wider humanity, and creation itself. We are a tradition concerned with the here and now and the conditions of people's lives today. One powerful example of this is how our principles are articulated as a covenant. We covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. We covenant to create practices that nurture justice and abiding compassion into the fabric of human relations. We covenant to join our efforts to work for a world where the web of life is infused with peace, justice, and equity, such that all people can thrive in their wholeness. The Universalists called this aspiration the kingdom of God. Today, we call it the beloved community. Covenant is a centerpiece of our theology because it calls us to practice and live our deepest values and the greatest aspirations we have for ourselves, humanity, and our world. Now, it's not about checking boxes and getting everything right. It's deeply spiritual work. It requires humility listening, forgiveness, and open-heartedness. Because we are human, we don't live our promises perfectly. But covenant teaches us how to seek forgiveness from one another and ourselves, and it teaches us how to heal and come back together. Covenants are life-affirming and life-saving because the truth is we need each other. We hold each other's well-being in our hands and in our actions, and this is not a burden but an incomparable gift. It's why we love. It's why we create enduring friendships. It's why someone's art can stir another's heart. It's why we gather in religious community and are deeply held and changed by its presence in our lives. Just like that quilt that hangs in my office, our UU principles reflect our fundamental interdependence and the role that covenant plays as a North Star, a guide for how we live and our commitments. So Sage, you asked earlier what it meant to be um, in covenant with someone. And a covenant is like an agreement, like how we want to be with each other. So what's an agreement you could make with like a friend? Um, we agree to be nice to each other and try our best. So be nice to each other and try your best? Yeah. <laughs> and what about what's an agreement or a way you want to be with your family? Uh, I want to love them and get things on their birthday. Love them and get them things on their birthday? You're so sweet. So what happens if someone like breaks the covenant. What happens if you and your friends agree that you're gonna be nice to each other and you're gonna have nice words with each other and then one of you doesn't have nice words with each other? Then what happens? How do we come back into covenant or come back into agreement? Um, you can say I didn't like it, that you can, can you please take it back? Okay, so you can ask them to take their words back, okay? Or we can also ask them, hey, what you said hurt me. Can you be more mindful next time about the words that you use, huh? Okay. So it's not always easy, right? When we make an agreement with someone to keep it. Do you agree with that or do you think it's always easy? Um, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, so when you were younger, <laughs> one of the things I said to you is that I would agree and covenant with you to use a nice voice right and not yell <laughs> when I'm upset but the other day I was really upset because I was having a hard day and I went to say something to your brother and sister and instead of just saying it mommy yelled was that nice of me no. 
No, right? Because I had agreed, right, to use a nice voice. And I yelled. And But after I sat and I thought about it, I came back to them and I said, you know what? I'm sorry. Mommy agreed to use a nice voice with you. And I didn't do that. So I broke my covenant with them, right? Yeah. So I apologized and explained that I was having a rough day. But that was not a good reason for me to break covenant with them. And we talked about it, and I apologized. And I said, I'm going to try, moving forward, to use my nicer voice. Right? Yeah. Do you think that was good? Uh-huh. And how do you think they felt? Uh, I think they felt proud of the mommy. You were pr- they were proud of their mommy? Yeah. Yeah. And so they said, I'm glad that you recognized and you came to us. And you said something about the way you were behaving. But sometimes we don't always n- notice that we've broken covenant, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe I came and I'm yelling at you and screaming at you, but then I don't ever come back and apologize. Then what happens? You break the co- covenant. I broke the covenant. But So could you say something to me about breaking the covenant? Yeah. What could you say to me? Oh, I say you broke the covenant. Can you please fix it? Okay, so you can tell me I broke the covenant, and can I please fix it? And how, in that case, would I fix it? Uh, you might say sorry, or sorry I yelled. Uh, I tried to not do it. Oh, that's nice. I'd say sorry I yelled, and I'm going to try in the future to not do that again. Yeah. Do you think it's good to have a covenant or an agreement with each other? Yeah. Why? Um, because if you break it, you learn from your mistakes. Because when you break covenant, you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. That's great advice, Sage. (laughs) Thank you so much. Bradshaw, when we think about being in covenant with one another, what do you think of? I think of an agreement with peers that allows you to come to a better understanding of each other. So what happens if we break covenant? Um, I know you had a situation with a friend where you all had an agreement about how you treat others and one of your friends deviated from that covenant. So how do we work on coming back into covenant with one another? I would talk to them, explain to them what they did wrong, try to come to an understanding and work together to figure out a solution. All right, so talking about it. And do you think that when we break covenant with one another that it is possible? to come back into covenant with with one another? I believe that it is possible, not all the time, maybe. Some people seem to not want to go into a sort of agreement, but for the people who are willing to change for the better, then yes. Yeah, I agree. Like, everyone within that group or within that community must want to be in a covenantal relationship in order for it to be um, successful. But as you said, if everyone is in agreement with the covenant, and works to, you know, uphold the covenant and come back into covenant, then I think it's something that can be successful in a multitude of situations. Would you agree? Yeah. This we know. We belong to each other. In 1963, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. articulated this truth from a narrow cell in Birmingham, Alabama. In his now famous letter from a Birmingham jail, King shared his sense of disappointment with white, moderate clergy who condemned the tactics of nonviolent direct action to confront the racist police violence, segregation, and Jim Crow laws of Birmingham. In that letter, King called us all to a deeper knowing of our interdependence, writing, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. King offered this soaring image along the backdrop of lament, frustration, and disappointment at the clergy who preach the values of equality, but in the moment of need and opportunity for real and material change in the lives of black Americans, 
condemned king. I imagine on a personal level that all of us know this feeling of disappointment and anger at being let down by those who you thought were with you and would show up alongside you in your moment of need. It's painful. And right now, we are all experiencing layers of this deep personal, social, and collective lament. As a religious community, we know these things to be true, that no one is outside the circle of love, that every person has worth and dignity, that love and compassion are the foundation for the world we need. We know this, and yet everywhere we see these values forsaken. For decades, we have witnessed the erosion of bonds of care, compassion, and shared investment in community. In just the 46 years of my lifetime, we've witnessed devastating rise of inequality, poverty, and indebtedness in the U.S. Alongside this has been the escalation of policing and mass incarceration and the criminalization of poverty. For more than a decade, we've witnessed the explicit political embrace on the right of dehumanizing and divisive rhetoric and policy rooted in racism, xenophobia, patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. For years, we've experienced the growth of propaganda and disinformation. And now we are living with the direct impacts of this rhetorical and policy violence in the banning of books and the silencing of history, in the suppression of voting rights, in the caging of children, and in the vigilante violence and growing support of an authoritarian anti-democratic white supremacist movement in the United States. And it is against this backdrop in the US that the COVID-19 pandemic began. And repeatedly, repeatedly, we have lost ground as we've responded to this virus through individualism, capitalism, and nationalism. Whether it is the refusal to wear masks out of some distorted notion of individual freedom or locking down borders in ways that betray racist assumptions to treating essential workers as expendable, to failing repeatedly to put global vaccination ahead of profits. We continue to fail in our responsibilities to each other. We live in a web of interdependence, whether or not we wish it so. And suffering thrives where the bonds of our relationships are defined by exploitation and domination. In the U.S., the coronavirus has thrived along historic and systemic fissures of disparity and racism and poverty. Fissures that have long defiled our social bonds. The impacts of these choices is that this virus has taken nearly a million lives in the U.S. and caused so much isolation, despair, and trauma for all of us but especially for those who are already impacted by systemic inequity and oppression. The layers of trauma, the layers of lament are deep. And in our own UU community, we've seen this disparity. We have lost so many young black leaders, not just to the pandemic, but to the stress of these times. The deep lament is because the crisis of this pandemic, alongside the crisis of global climate change, of which the two are not unrelated, actually creates the necessity and the opportunity to draw humanity together for collective action to save lives and protect the future of our species. But again and again, we've chosen to double down on division, nationalism, profits, and a deadly status quo. Now, to be clear, I'm not pointing back to some golden day that never was. What we need is to chart a new way forward, rooted in covenant, rooted in an understanding of our fundamental belonging and our responsibilities to one another. King understood this. 
when he reminded us that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. It is why it is so important to understand that the crises we face today are not just economic or political or social or even environmental. They are fundamentally spiritual and moral crises, reflective of the ways that the threads of connection that bind us have been defiled by greed and exploitation. And the tools we need, the tools we need to reweave these bonds are compassion, deep solidarity, mutuality, and care. These are defining times. It matters that we root ourselves in deep care for one another and a courageous commitment to the struggle for justice and thriving for everyone and for our shared future. After all, our religious communities are not social clubs. Our theology, our commitment to covenant is not an intellectual exercise. It is a call to a way of living and being. It is a call to action. This is no time for a casual faith, no time for a casual commitment to one another and the values of human dignity, justice, and compassion that we hold dear. And this is no time to go it alone. Practicing covenant reminds us that it is an act of faithfulness to continue showing up for and with one another. It is an act of faithfulness to continue to center care in how we live in the midst of division. This is a time where we need greater courage and greater solidarity and a deeper commitment to the well being of all people and all communities. We need investments that address poverty, climate change, and that invest in democracy and in human flourishing. Whenever I hear King's words, that we are tied in a single garment of destiny, I imagine humanity is a collection of brilliant stars held together across the fabric of the expansive night sky, holding promise for what can be when we understand that we belong to each other and that we share responsibility for one another. I also remember our own universalist forebears who believed in universal salvation, but also knew that hell was something that existed here in this life fostered by systemic injustice. And our work as a people of faith is to love the hell out of this world, to join our efforts to work for a world where the web of life is infused with care, with peace, with justice, with compassion, and equity such that all people can thrive in their wholeness. May it be so. We're all connected, bird cloud and tree. We're all connected, earth, wind and sea. Connected, breath you and me. We're all connected, bird, cloud, and tree. We're all connected, earth, wind, and sea. Woven in a single garment of destiny, we're all connected. Breath you and me, we're all connected, all connected, bird, cloud, and tree, bird, cloud, and tree, we're all connected, all connected, bird, wind, and sea, bird, wind, and sea, woven in a single garment of destiny. Breath you and me, we're 
we're all connected, breath you and me. When covenant breaks. When covenant breaks, hope flickers and doubt seeps in like floodwaters through the cracks in the basement. While the many return to the comforts of their congregation, we are left staring at the door that was slammed in our faces, wondering if we should walk back in and why. Our faith demands growth demands inclusion of those who were never like us, whatever side of that us you fall on. But words can so easily be cast aside in the moment when they matter. Covenant is a promise that we will work together on a team we didn't choose, doing group work we like the idea of far more than the thing itself. It is the radical answer to a radical goal, at least on paper. For our faith does not give us answers for what to do when covenant breaks. When we see that some would rather cling to their patriarchy and their white supremacy, would make problem people of the whistleblowers and hateful radicals of those just asking for rights. Would pretend that the promises of covenant mean nothing unless the person is just like you. But then, standing in that cold with that door slammed in front of you, something shifts. Covenant is a promise between the people of this faith. But it is also a promise between ourself and our faith. And sometimes nothing takes more faith than staying. Choosing to speak of your broken heart to those who are brave enough to face change. To stay in dialogue and have those hard conversations you never wanted to have. And choosing to be angry rather than walk away. All of these are holding true to your promises. When covenant breaks, we are sent back to the beginning again, like a toddler on their time out to think about what just happened, or a minister on their sabbatical call to remember what we fell in love with in the first place. This ship is not sinking. It is only rocked by the violent waves of oppression, and everyone has contributed to the oppression of someone, if not everyone. May that humility keep us listening, even when our own pain hasn't been heard yet. Even when our relationships are shattering like crystals falling to cold stone, even when all you need is a hug and your community won't open its arms yet. When covenant breaks, we need to come home to trust. To trust that there are others out there who would have supported you if they were only there. And to trust that our faith will always be here tomorrow. Bound by nothing more or less than the promises made by people willing to fight. Like a golden web glimmering with dew in the first light of morning. Because when covenant breaks, it is a tear merely in a web still holding strong. And as long as we believe in ourselves and in the greatness that we could become together, then we can always come back tomorrow, roll up our sleeves and start weaving again. When I invite you to hold silence with me, I'm not instructing you to hold still, in fact, you might rise in body or in spirit, or you might shift your position, whatever helps you turn your body and your heart into the most receptive vessels possible. It might even help 
if you want to hold something like a chalice so that its weight reminds us that even silence can be sacred. So if you find that your mind gets very, very restless, you might remember that one purpose of silence is to notice and observe. Another purpose could be to prepare ourselves for the singing and the prayer and the work ahead to till that receptive ground. Another purpose might be just to take in everything that's been offered so far. And it might be easier knowing that we're doing it together. However you make yourself comfortable, please share some silence with me. with the gifts of silence and shared breath with us, with the gift of connection across space and place and time, we turn our hearts to prayer. Spirit of life and love, what words are there for this week? What words are there for this pain? For the continued loss of life? For the terror that children and families and all of us feel? For the ongoing trauma and terror that our Black and Indigenous, our Asian and Pacific Islander, our queer and transgender and non-binary community members live with? What words are there for the grief that grips our hearts as inaction freezes the possibility of change that could protect so many? What words are there? To be hurt, to be a witness to pain, to be blocked by those in power from making change that could keep others from being hurt. It is harm upon harm upon harm. Our hearts are broken and breaking, and we are here. We are connecting in the ways that we can, trusting that even when there are no words, when our feelings run from numbness to disbelief to rage to sobbing sorrow, that those feelings can be held together. That we can live with the discomfort instead of turning away. That we can learn to feel those feelings, to move with them and through them as we do the work of transformation that allows us to turn pain into justice, into love, into belonging. Today our hearts are with all those whose hearts are broken open by grief, 
frustration and rage, for all those who are living with hurts that are acknowledged and unacknowledged, and for all of us who somehow within it all find ourselves knowing connection through shared breath, through shared experience, through shared faith. All of us, I hope, who are knowing moments of joy and beauty that are medicine for our wounds and strength for our spirits, that we might hold on, placing our trust in the power of connection to hold us through all of the turnings of our lives. Together here in the sanctuary, joining together online, we hold all of those things, beauty and joy and gratitude, sorrow and pain and fear. And we invite you now to speak aloud if you'd like or type into the chat anyone you'd like to name in this space. For all those who are sitting vigil at bedsides today, accompanying those through illness or death, our thoughts are with you. For all those celebrating milestone life turnings in this season, our hearts are with you. And this morning I name my wife Loretta and her family as her father is preparing for surgery today for the second time this week for treatment for cancer. Together we hold so much in this sanctuary. And together we pray that the grip of addiction might be loosened, that the weight of oppression might be lightened, that truth might be told, that joy might break through, and that love might make every suffering bearable for us all. May it be so. Amen. In just a moment, we'll sing together. Just as long as I have breath, hymn number six in your gray hymnal. And we'll continue our connection with our larger UU community of faith. And during that time, we will also practice our spiritual practice of giving and receiving and growing by the sharing of our financial resources. So you'll see up there or see on your screen that you can give in many ways. We do this as a reminder that we are in the constant flow of giving and receiving and growing together. That there are times in our lives when we might need to receive. And if that is the case for you, we invite you to be in touch with any staff member at church. We have financial resources to share if this is a difficult time. And if this is a time when you have resources to give, we invite you to do so. The offering today will go to support the work of this church. And we hope that if you are able, you will give generously. And if you need to receive, that during this time, plot out who you're going to talk to and how and when so that we can support each other. So I'll remind us, please give generously as you're able. Please join in singing if you'd like. And there are just a few pieces left to the service. So feel free to be here. Feel free to move around if you need to as well. And join us for coffee downstairs afterwards if you're here. I invite the ushers to come forward. As long as vision lasts, 
time must answer yes to truth in my dream and in my dark always that elusive spark if they ask what i did well tell them i said yes to truth La del corazón Debo decir si al amor Me dolió la decepción Y aún así te di el perdón Si preguntan qué hice bien Diles dijo si al amor Just as long as my heart beats, I must answer yes to love. Disappointment pierced me through, still I kept on loving you. If they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to A spark of the holy can never be extinguished. Our chalice flame lives on each week in the very marrow of our bones, in the sparks of creativity and the glimmers of love, which infuse and invigorate the best moments of our day to day. May we carry that light onward as we go forth as the symbol of our chosen faith, which recalls us to the sacred promises of our covenant as we close our sacred time and extinguish this physical chalice flame. We are not alone, though sometimes we forget that truth. We are woven into one cloth, one gorgeous blanket, designed for use, for comfort, to sustain and to love. And each and every day, this world advertises the potential of our shared beauty. It is there for the taking for the making, for the weaving. In this moment, here together, we remember that we are the woven and also the weavers. Each of us rooted in generations and stretching towards the future. Held by communities and beholden to them. Seeking wholeness and sought by life's desire for itself. Loving the world and beloved so much more than we realize. Part of the web of the beautiful blanket of creation.
No, I'm not like leverage to get off of me. What do you mean leverage? Don't lean on me. Lean on Unless me. you're not strong. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's just start. Okay. Joke now. Okay, why did the pickle cross the road? Why did the pickle cross the road? Because of the pickle. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> because of the pickle. Thank you, Sage. You're welcome.